Well, let me take care of a couple of housekeeping matters right off the bat. First of all, it is such a privilege to be back in Grenada. Uh, my family and I enjoyed our five years here in this community immensely. This is one of our favorite places that we have ever lived, and it is such a joy to be back. And I really appreciate Brother Brian's invitation to come and to fill the pulpit while he is in revival this morning and tonight and through the week. And I do encourage you to continue to be in prayer. And if you're available, to go over and to support him there at Holcomb Baptist with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, Brother Kevin Tribble, their pastor is a wonderful man of God, and just encourage you to be in support of them this week. So that's the first thing. Number two, I do want to bring you greetings from your Mississippi Baptist Convention from Dr. Jim Futrell, our Executive Director Treasurer, and just tell you how much we appreciate what you as Mississippi Baptists continue to do what you're doing as you have been planted here in this place, not only sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with those around you, but through your cooperative program giving, your willingness to go beyond the borders of this, just this community into your state, into the nation, to the world. And we appreciate what you are doing and continue to do in any way we can help and be of assistance to you. We want to do that. And so I do want to say those two things. I would invite you this morning, if you would, to turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. As you're turning there, uh, we're, we're kicking back off, of course, the school year. Have you guys started school yet? Are you back in? <laughs> it's coming. Um, our crew starts tomorrow there in Brandon, and, uh, of course, they're all about as thrilled as you probably are. But that also means that this is a good thing. For most of our churches, most of us probably do Wednesday night meals. You guys do Wednesday night meals here, right? Uh-uh, uh-uh. It stops. All right, we'll talk after this is over because that's something's wrong. With, okay, well, look, I want to introduce what I think may be an opportunity for you to get back into what I think is one of the greatest gifts God has given the modern church, and that's Wednesday night meals. Um, it's not the only thing you can do, but I think one of the easiest things to do is to do soup. Now, I know it's kind of hot right now. It's, what, 87, around 90 here. It was 106 heat index, 108 heat index yesterday in Jackson. So I know we're not thinking soup right now. We will be soon. And I have discovered an inexpensive but larger than normal soup ladle that is now available in stores. It's actually been out for some time. I don't know why more churches aren't using these, but I discovered this. I brought one with me this morning as an example, and I'm very excited about these. Now, the only problem I've discovered, every hardware store, every store I go into, they've got them turned up wrong. I think it's easier to ship them this way so they don't get messed up. So in order to get it right, you've got to spend a little bit of time and tweak it slightly. But once you get it, see, ah, come on. Now, you've got to work hard at this, but once you get it done, see, this is awesome. The, the soup ladles they generally sell in stores are not big enough, and so I discovered these soup ladles will really, they'll dip out a full bowl twice, and you got a huge bowl. This is awesome. I'm OCD. There's no chance I'm going to drink any soup or eat any soup that came out of this thing. I don't care how clean it is. I wouldn't even touch this if you, I, this has not been used, okay? Listen, as goofy as that sounds, what is the purpose of this? Well, we all know, I hope, what the purpose of this is. It's not to ladle soup. Now, could you do that? Well, yes, but there are two problems. Number one, nobody's going to want to eat it. And number two, when you need it for what it was designed for, it may not be usable. As goofy as that sounds, as I go around this state, I have discovered many of our churches are struggling. And by struggling, I mean they've plateaued in their growth or they're declining in their attendance. There are a variety of reasons to this, but I'll tell you one of the things I've discovered why. It's because many believers, I don't want to say most, but many believers do not know how God has designed and gifted and what role he has called them to fill in the body of Christ. And just like the misapplication of this tool you could use it for something other than what it was designed for, but the problem is it wasn't designed to ladle soup. You need the right tool for the right job. You need to be sure that you're using what something was meant to do for the purpose it was meant to be given. And I want to tell you as God's people, every single person in this room who knows Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, God has a design and a purpose for you. 
And it is crucial. It is not a side issue. It's not a secondary matter. It is crucial in the life of the body of Christ and in the work of the kingdom that you find and fill your role because if you don't do your job, that job will either go undone or it will not be done properly. We need believers all through this community, this state, this nation, the world. We need people stepping up to the plate and doing what God has called them to do. And this morning, what I'd like to do is spend a few moments helping us discover that by design, God has a purpose and a plan for every single member of the body of Christ. Now, here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I wish we had time to dig into all four chapters because actually it's chapters 12 through 14. But if you're like me, come around 1130, it'll be time to go to lunch and we can only take so much. And so we're going to focus this morning on verses 4 through 12 of 1 Corinthians as we seek to find and fill our unique God-given role and find our design that God has given each one of us to fulfill his purpose and plan. Now, beginning with verse 4 down through verse 12, it says, Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, the Holy Spirit. There are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. We're going to come back to this. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one, each individual one, it says, is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the one Spirit, to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, to another distinguishing of spirits, different kinds of tongues, and interpretation of tongues. Look at verses 11 and 12. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. For even as the body is one, and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. All right, right off the bat, the first thing we need to do is get a handle on what is meant by church and church membership. First of all, we need to understand what church is and what church is not. Now, over the centuries, some understandings of the word church, when you use the word church, some understandings have developed. Some of them aren't necessarily bad, but they can take us the wrong direction if we don't correct them or at least explain a little deeper. Right? For example, some people think church is a building. Now, when we pass by church buildings, wherever we are, you know, we'll usually say, well, there's so-and-so church. I do it all the time because, you know, we serve as 2,100 Mississippi Baptist churches from the Jackson building, and, and there, that's a lot of church buildings. So we go past buildings all the time. There's so-and-so church. There's so-and-so church. Now, that's fine, but here's the problem. Many people think just that. Well, the church is a building. If every church building in America burned down tonight, there would still be a church. Okay? In fact, well, no, I won't go that far, but I will say this. We need to be very careful that we don't allow our beautiful facilities to get in the way of genuine ministry and commitment to God. They're wonderful tools, but they are just that. This is a tool. It's great. I love being in here and not outside in the heat or the cold or the rain or the whatever. But the reality is this is not the church. Okay? Now, some people go the opposite direction. They say, well, church is not a building, but church is an organization, all right? And at its worst, some would say, well, church is a club or a business. Others would say, well, no, it's just an organized group of people doing their thing for Jesus. Well, should the church be organized? Yes, God is a God of order. We know that. But we don't need to get to the point where we see church as an organization only. This is not a club with club members. This is not a business. Yes, we use business principles and we use some common sense, but this is far more than just a building or a business. All right? Now, this gets a little closer. You see this picture with the, the faces, with people? This is a little closer to what the biblical picture is. We could say, well, church is people. You, you all remember this? Here is the church. Here is this. Come on, if you love Jesus, open the doors and see all the people. You remember that? Some of you haven't done this. Where have you been all your Baptist life? All right. Well, that's fine. That's true. Yet church is people. No question about that. The problem when we gather is, if we're not careful, we can have a mixture of folks. You can have saved, and you can have some lost folks in there too. 
Now, do we want lost people coming into the building and participating with God's people? Well, to a point we do, because we want them to hear the gospel and experience the presence of God through his people. But the reality is this image, even though it gets closer, is not quite there. And you could almost say here, well, church is family. Yes, it is, and it should be. We are a family of God. We're a family of faith. And by the way, I much prefer to hear people say, well, I'm a member of the Friendship Baptist family. I love that. I think that's great. But it still doesn't get to the heart of what the Bible says. It's this fourth picture, as ugly as it looks. It's this fourth picture that really tells us what the Bible says church is. Go back again with me, if you will, to verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Listen to what he says. Paul writes and says, For even as the body, he's talking about the human body, even as the physical body is one, yet has many members. Members here means parts, body parts. So even as the body, the human body, is one but has many parts and each part makes up the whole, he says so also is Christ. This is very important. First of all, when you talk about church membership, it is more than being a part of a local building, club, organization, or even family of faith. Biblically, church membership is your taking active part in being a part of the body of Christ. This is so important. Membership is about being an active part of Christ's body. Finding and filling your and my unique role that God has called and gifted us to fill within Christ's body. If we don't fill, find and fill our role, that role will either go unmet or will have to be made up by the other members of the body of Christ. So, the church needs you. They need your active participation, not just your money, not just your stuff, not even just your attendance. They need your active involvement in the kingdom work that God is doing right here in Friendship Baptist Church, in this local body of believers. So they need you, but listen, you need them. When I pastored in Hattiesburg, this was, oh goodness, this was about 15 years ago. I still had hair. No kidding. I really did. In fact, that's the point of the story. I went to get my hair cut. It's been a long time. Went to get my hair cut. Never been to this place before. It was a lady I'd never met. So I don't generally tell people what I do for a living because people act funny when you tell them you're a preacher. You know what I'm talking about, guys? I mean, it's just they act weird. So I usually don't tell folks right off the bat. Well, this lady's behind me cutting my hair. Scissors are just snipping away. And sure enough, here it comes. She says, so what do you do for a living? I said, well, I'm a pastor. And she stopped cutting. I thought, oh, no, I'm dead. She's going to lob them right in my neck, and it's all over, and I'll never see my family again. It's all over. First thing out of her mouth, why well, do I have to go to church to worship God? I didn't say you had to. Put the scissors down, all right? <laughs> so we, we got to talking a minute, and sure enough, she was angry about something that had happened at a local church, and I don't remember all the particulars, but the same story I've heard over and over again for however many years I've been in the ministry. Now, are some of those stories legitimate? Yes, but here is the bottom line. I said, well, let me tell you. You're right. This shocked her out of her gourd. I said, you don't have to go to church to worship God. In fact, I would argue if the only time you worship God is when you go to church, then you're missing out. Because you see, if you expect to get your Jesus once a week when you pop up in here, you're not going to get it. It just doesn't work that way. You ought to be worshiping, serving God all week long. Then when we come together as a body, we can celebrate what God's been doing all week long. All right? So I said, no, you don't have to go to church to worship God. I said, in fact... The reality is you need to attend a local body of believers if you claim to know Jesus, and she did. You need to attend with a local body so you can not only serve them, but so they can serve you and serve alongside you. We talked for a few minutes about that. See, people do not understand sometimes that it really is about God, but it's also about people. Serving with one another, serving one another, serving alongside one another. Now, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11, both of these talk about the importance of being a part, an active part of the body of Christ. And when I talk about membership, what I always like to do is to go back to this passage here in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4, 5, and 6. Very quickly, and I'll make this swift, but notice what it says. I love how the Holy Spirit, who I believe inspired every word in this book, by the way, I think from the very first word in Genesis to the last word in Revelation, I believe every word is inspired by God is there for a reason. 
Now, because of that, if you look at the progression of these verses, notice what he says. We read it a moment ago. He says there are a variety of gifts. Now, we're going to come back to this, explain it a little bit more. But verse 4 talks about gifts. By gifts, he means the Holy Spirit's supernatural empowerment, not just the ability to do something you can naturally do on your own, but this is the Holy Spirit's uh, presence and power in and through your life, uniquely helping you to serve him in a special way. So he says there are varieties of these. We'll come back to that in a moment. So verse 4, variety of gifts. Those gifts, he said, are fulfilled or worked out in a variety of ministries. That's verse 5. Those are the contexts within which we exercise our gifts. And incidentally, according to Scripture, those ministries, those contexts are always within the parameters of a local church. Now, I don't mean we can only serve God when we're together inside the building or together as a body. What I mean is it's only through the connection of a local church that our gifts can find their full fulfillment. All right? So, you have a variety of gifts given by the Spirit, a variety of ministries within which we use those gifts, and then verse 6 says there are a variety of effects. Verse 6 says our, the effects that we uh, have or that we see as a local body are directly proportionate to our willingness to use God gifts through our ministries. This is very important, folks. One of the reasons, if you back this, this train up, one of the reasons many of our local churches aren't being as effective is because people aren't using their gifts within the context of the ministry God's given them. They're expecting the staff to do all the ministry, or the deacons to do all the ministry, or the Sunday school teacher to do all the ministry, or someone else to do their part. Folks, everybody has a role to play, and every member of the body of Christ must do more than show up a couple of times a week because there's far more to be done than what we do the few times we're together. So, with that said, Understanding that we're a body, that the body's made up of members, body parts, and every single person in here who knows Jesus as their Savior, there's the key, every one of us has a place and a role of the body. How do we determine what our role, what our design, what our purpose is? Now, let me just say, because the way this works, you and I don't get to choose what we want to do. Now, I'm going to clarify that. You and I don't choose our roles, but we're chosen and gifted by the Holy Spirit for our roles. I mean, doesn't it specifically say here in verse 12, and it does, that even as the body is one, we're many members, though they're one, we're all in Christ. Verse 11 says, one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one as He wills. The Holy Spirit doesn't come to us and say, what do you want to do? He says, this is what I have called and chosen you to do. So, Michael, are you telling me that I don't have any choice at all whether I serve on that committee or whether I teach that class or whether... I'm not saying you don't have any choice at all. Of course you have some choices. But your and my choices are limited to the parameters of God's will and plan for our life. His call, his gifting, his purpose for you. So if we try to step out of his parameters that he's given us, we're going to be miserable and we're not going to be as... as capable of functioning the way he's called us to. It's just like this. If I try to use it for what it wasn't intended, not only am I misusing the object, but I'm, I'm potentially making it where it's not going to function properly anymore when it is called upon to do what it's supposed to do. Same thing for you and me. So you and I need to make sure, are we doing what God has called us to do? Are we not doing anything at all? Or are we doing what we're doing because it's what we want to do? So, how do you and I determine what God's call is on our life uniquely? Well, I like to use the acrostic design, D-E-S-I-G-N. Now, there are different ways to do this. For years, I used shape, S-H-A-P-E. I like this better, and I'll show you why as we progress through this. What I'd like to do is take you through the, the uh, six key principles here of helping determine who you are uniquely in Christ, how God has gifted, developed, determined you to fit in the body, and then how you can maximize the potential that God's given you within the context of the whole body of Christ. So let's talk about all six of these elements. We'll do this rather quickly. You could spend probably a Sunday on every one of them. Well, let's do this rather swiftly. First of all, the D stands for development. Development. Uh, my background, my bachelor's degree was in psychology. I tell people all the time, I know enough to know when I can't help you, okay? Uh, but I did spend a good bit of time studying human development, which was fascinating to me. Because, remember, God has created us. He has created us uniquely. We're different than all the rest of creation and the animals and the plant. No matter what the, the 
heathenistic scientific community tries to tell you, you and I are uniquely created and designed. We didn't spring up from apes and plant life and all. We were created uniquely. And God has a unique developmental process for each individual uh, human being. Now, as an outcome of that developmental process, we wind up with what we usually call, because we like to package it in easy terms, we usually talk about our personalities. Now, personalities can be used too narrowly. We sometimes try to say, well, so-and-so is friendly. Well, that doesn't tell everything about so-and-so we need to know. Or so-and-so usually seems kind of grumpy, all right? Or we go down the laundry list of personality traits. Well, the issue is we need to remember it's more than just how we act. It's about who we are. And we got where we are through the process of development. And each of us, while we may have some similarities, we're all uniquely different. We come from different families, different backgrounds, different educational situations, different economic situations, uh, different ethnic uh, makeup. I mean, you name it. We're all different. And so when we talk about our development, we can't ignore the fact that God in his providence has allowed us to come where we are but doesn't want to leave us where we are. Let me show you why that is. When it comes to development and ultimately who we are in terms of personality and coping traits, really personality and development is all about the way you cope with the world. Uh, for some people, they seem to cope with the world fairly well. Other people, not so much. What's brought us to the point where we cope with things this way? Where when something happens, we react in love or we react in anger. We get frustrated or we shut down. What's brought us to that point? Well, as you go through scripture, you can see uh, just a host of different personality types. For example, Peter. Peter, of course, was very bold, which is a great thing. But when sin crept in, he became headstrong and, and in many ways almost defiant. I mean, this is the same one who looked at the, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and said, there's no way you're going to the cross. And that's when Jesus had to compare him to Satan and say, you better get behind me, get back in line, because you're acting just like the enemy. Uh, what about Paul? One of my favorite people in Scripture. Paul was very logical. He was also very confrontational. Paul was one of those guys that if you really got him riled, he would confront you. Now, some of that confrontation is good, but I have the suspicion that he could also really hurt your feelings. And if you're a feeling person, you probably don't want to spend most of your day with Paul. What about John? John was very relational. We see that in Scripture. This is the one who, uh, at the Lord's Supper, reclined on Jesus' breast. Now, as men, we go, boy, that's... But that was a very relational thing to do in that day and age. So he was also very emotive. I mean, this is one of the two sons of thunder. Remember uh, James and John who come to Jesus after a town has rejected him? And they came and said, Jesus, can we call fire down now and burn them all up? And Jesus said, uh, let's back that down a bit. No, we're not going to burn them all up right now. Uh, got other things we're going to do right now. And so he was very emotive. He responded sometimes the right way, sometimes the wrong way. This is what we need to understand. Our personality, our development, our background is never an excuse for sin. I find this all the time. Well, it's just the way I was raised. Well, if it violates God's word, it's sin. Well, it's just how I act. Well, if it is and it violates God's word, then it's sin. We need to quit calling something something other than what it is. And I'm afraid, as someone who came from a psych psychological background, I'm telling you right now, too many people like to play the, it's not my fault card. If you're sinning against God, it is your fault. When I sin, I choose to sin. In fact, I've got a problem in my life. When I became a Christian, came to know Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior, he set me free from slavery to sin. See, before I knew Jesus, I couldn't do anything about it. Now that I know Jesus, I don't have any excuse at all. None. When I sin, I choose to jump headlong into it. I hear people say, well, it just happened. No, it didn't. It didn't just happen. You chose to do it. You chose to disobey. It's never an excuse for sin. I had a lady tell me one time at a church, not First Grenada, had a lady tell me at a church uh, several churches ago, well, I just say what I think. And I was too young to know how to be diplomatic. And I said, well, that's fine, but you better be sure Jesus wants you to say what you say. See, that's part of our problem. Are we really, truly sold out to Jesus to the point that whatever our development and background and personality, we're willing to say, Jesus, whatever is not right in my life, I give it to you to allow you to make it what it should be.
All right? Incidentally, I love this. I, I wish we had time to dig into this a little deeper. This is called the disc profile. I strongly recommend folks take something like this at some point in your life because it sort of gives you a broad idea of how you generally cope with the world. So, for example, I'll just give you one of these. You have someone who... Uh, has what we call a dominant personality. I know that sounds bad, but it's not meant to be. It just means they're one of those people that when things are, are right between them and God, they're very direct and decisive. They're a doer. We need people like that. But when they allow sin to take control and when they get off kilter with the Spirit of God, they can become very domineering and very demanding and downright difficult to deal with. The same thing is true of all the other personality types. So my, my point in this is, do not allow where you've come from, good and bad and challenging. Don't allow who you are, good and challenging. Don't allow that to keep you from being everything God has called you to be because God wants to meet you where you are, but he doesn't want to leave you there, all right? So, E. E stands for experiences. This sort of speaks for itself. I mean, all of us have different experiences. And those experiences up to this point in our life, whether you're 2 or whether you're 92, those experiences include a variety of things. For many of us, it's vocational. For most of us, it's educational experiences we've had or are having. Spiritual experiences. And by spiritual here, I'm not talking about salvation per se. I'm talking about those benchmark spiritual moments in your life that you know as you go back in your, your life's history, you can say that was a moment when God did something unique in me or that was a turning point in my life. All of us have had painful experiences to a greater or lesser degree. All of us have experienced success. All of us have experienced failure. What I want us to understand is God can take all those experiences, whatever they are, and use them for his glory if we will allow him. To. Some people get stuck in one experience and they try to live their life either recapturing that moment or they wallow in that moment the rest of their life. We can't afford to do that. Let God move us from where we are. All right, what about S? D-E-S-S -S stands for skills. By skills here, we're talking about your abilities, what you are able to do. Now, there are two classifications broadly of these. First of all, there are natural abilities or skills. They were seemingly present at birth. It's like you were born and you were able to do whatever this is, all right? But then all of us have things that we've learned throughout the course of our life, no matter what our age. We acquire these, whether through school or work or maybe even through our hobby or interest. Whatever they are, God has gifted all of us to do something. And some people get caught up with, well, if I could only do what they can do, then God could use me. No, if you just do what God has gifted you to do, then we're in good shape, all right? So natural and learned abilities. Then, of course, I. I stands for interests. And while I'd like to spend more time in this, just very quickly, all of us have interests. Now, the thing is, because we churchify stuff, we usually make things seem like, well, these are spiritual interests over here, like Bible reading and going to church, and, you know, whatever. The, you know, we, those are spiritual. Then there's everything else. Well, actually, everything done for God is spiritual. Everything the child of God does under the inspiration of God, the leadership of God for the lordship of Christ, it's all spiritual. And so you could have an interest that to the world and even sometimes to the church doesn't look like it matters. Let's just consider uh, films or movies. What about the church that uh, has now come out with all those incredible films over the years uh, that have led millions of people either to faith in Christ or back to a relationship with God? Can you imagine the interest that came out of uh, the folks who first started saying, yeah, we, we love making movies, but that's really not a church thing. It became a church thing, and God has used it for his glory. You can think about other areas, photography and writing and gardening, and I mean, you just, just go down the list of stuff. Here's the thing. God may take your interest and pair you with other believers to help do some unique things, or he may take your interest and put you in touch with lost people who have that same interest and let you share with them in a way they otherwise would not possibly hear. Now, the thing about interest is these personal interests, hobbies, sometimes we'll call them passions, these are the things that if you're honest, this is what motivates you. If you have the T-shirt that says, I'd rather be, well, what's the, you know, well, we're in church. I'd rather be reading my Bible. Yeah, 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 yeah. What would you really rather be doing? I'd rather be shopping. That's my wife. She's professional. I'd rather be, I don't know, kayaking. That is not me, but I just use that one. I'd rather be whatever, whatever that is. God can use that, but here's the key. They should always reflect Christ in Scripture. If your interest, your passion 
is unbiblical, is unscriptural, you're in sin and you need to deal with it. What's usually the case, though, is that interest is not necessarily unbiblical, but we allow our interests to take us away from God's greater purpose. All right? Now, I'm about to step on toes, but I'm leaving at the end of the day. So if you have an interest, let's say, in the sports area that takes your family out of church on a regular basis, uh, you might want to rethink that. Or if you have an interest that keeps you from being actively involved in the things of God, I'm not talking about you're having to work to make ends meet and do what God's calling you to do. I realize that. But I'm saying if you have anything in your life that God could use, but you're so busy with your interest, you've lost interest in God, then you've got a problem. All right? So make sure your interest, your passion, doesn't violate the Word of God or take you away from the greater things God has for you. All right. Now, let's move to spiritual gifts. That's the G. Now, here's what I want you to think about. Those first four things, D-E-S-I, those first four things, every human being on the planet has those. Lost and saved. By the way, there are only two people, two types of people on the planet. Lost and saved. That's it. That's it. Lost people have those first four things. Development and experiences. And, and they have all those four. This is where it differentiates us. Only saved people have the Holy Spirit. Only those of us who've received Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior have the Spirit of God living in us. And therefore, only the believer has and can exercise spiritual gifts. Now, according to Scripture, I wish we had more time to dig into this, but according to Scripture, there are some things you and I need to know about spiritual gifts. They are supernatural endowments. They are something that God will do through you that you could not do on your own. Now, my observation is God usually pairs them with natural abilities, but he does something unique through them that you could not accomplish if it were just in your own strength. These are supernatural empowerments that God does. Now, number two, every single believer has at least one. Every one. If you know Jesus as your Savior, Lord, you have the Spirit living in you, and according to Scripture, the moment the Spirit came to live in you, He gifted you to do something. Now, some people believe we have more than one gift. That's fine. In fact, if you've ever taken a spiritual gifts inventory or test, usually they have the top three. Um, my observation is most folks score high on one, and my personal opinion based on the text of Scripture is every believer has one primary gift. Whether we have more than that, you know, I don't know. But every believer has at least one gift, but here's the important part. No one has them all. No believer has all the gifts. Therefore, we need each other. You, there's no such thing as Lone Ranger Christianity. You cannot do this Jesus thing on your own. You need the body of Christ because not only do they need your giftedness to fill in the holes, you need everybody else to help you because you're not capable of handling life on your own. You're just not. No one has all the gifts, and therefore no one is capable of doing this on their own. Gifts exist in the context of a connection to a local church. It's not that ministry just happens here, but ministry happens in and through the local body of Christ. We need each other, and I can't stress that enough. Well, what about the end? We've gone through all this other part. What does the end stand for? Well, this is one of my favorite pictures. I love old maps, and this is a map and a compass. I let N stand for what I call navigating the need. See, gifts were not given just for you to enjoy your Christian life. They weren't given to you, and your place in the body wasn't given to you just so you could have your needs met and be happy all the live long day. You were gifted and placed in the body to help meet needs. The question becomes, what are those needs and how can God use me? Let me give you a practical illustration. I'll give you two quickly. Well, at uh, church a few years ago, we had an individual who went through this process and uh, their development, well, they were an outgoing person, a self-starter. They'd grown up in a very uh, strong Christian home that encouraged them to be everything God wanted them to be. And so they, were, they had developed a very outgoing personality, and you could rely on them just to do their own thing and get it done for Jesus, all right? Their experiences, Christ-centered childhood, but they grew up watching many of their friends, either from broken homes or non practicing Christian households and the struggles that they had compared to his own childhood. This was a guy, by the way. The S, he was very creative. He was uh, uh, good at teaching. In fact, he was actually a teacher in a school. And he was great at sports, very athletic. His interests, he loved kids, had three kids himself, loved children, and loved children's ministry for all the right reasons. 
Now, his gifts, and when he went through the process of discovering his spiritual gifts, discovered this was no big shock. He had the gift of evangelism. This was a guy who could walk up to you, and in five minutes, he could be talking about Jesus and whether or not you knew him in a way that you weren't, you weren't offended. You were, it's just his natural, but also spiritual gift. So when he went to navigate the need to determine, and we helped him with this, determine what does God want you to do? As we looked at his profile and we looked at the needs of our church and community, our church, this was in Hattiesburg, was located half a mile from a school. And that school, and I actually had the opportunity a couple of times to go in and speak to some of the students. This school was chocked full of people uh, or, or kids who came from uh, non-Christian households, broken homes. It was a very difficult place. And so this man determined that God wanted him to start an after-school ministry for first through sixth graders who came from difficult family backgrounds. He used sports, he also did tutoring, and it was a wonderful ministry that God led him to, something that our church was not doing and would not have done had he not stepped up to the plate. Quickly, let me give you another. This was a lady, very friendly lady, but she was shy, she's very organized. Um, her experiences. Well, she'd grown up in a military family, so she knew what it was like to move from place to place and be new in a community. Every two years, she moved, so she knew how difficult that could be. Her skill, she was great, I'm talking about awesome, at baking and making things. I can't do stuff like that. She could bake and craft, and she was just great at it. Her interest, she liked having fun, but with a purpose. And so when you looked at her spiritual gifts, she actually had, and the Bible talks about this, the spiritual gift of hospitality. So when we helped her navigate the need, we had an outreach program. But in our outreach program, really, we just kind of showed up at your door, gave you a packet, and that's great. But she decided, even though she wasn't the person who would jump out there and be the, the first one to talk to you, she decided she would use her gifts and skills and abilities to uh, make welcome baskets for first-time guests. She would actually put together a welcome basket with uh, baked goods and some home crafted items. I started to rejoin the church just so I could get one of these baskets. I mean, this was phenomenal stuff. Now, you may look at these two things you think, well, that's great, I'm not interested in that. That's fine. That's not your design. That's not who you are. That's, you just eliminated two. That's wonderful. It's not up to you and me to be them. It's up to us to be us but to be us in context of the greater body of Christ. Where are the needs in this local church? If you want to know, ask your staff. I'm telling you, they know where a lot of those needs are. The fact is, you and I need to discern and discover who God has created us to be and find and fill that role. And last thing I'll tell you, sometimes, and this is just like my illustration, sometimes we try to force ourselves, or maybe we force others, where we don't actually fit. We're going to do two things. We're going to hurt ourselves or hurt other people. And we're missing out on God's best. Well, it's got to be done. I know it has to be done. There's some stuff that's got to be taken care of. I know that. But could it be that if I would get out of the way, God would raise up the right person? That God has somebody waiting in the wings. I've just never let go long enough to let that happen. Or maybe we just need to encourage people. We know God is gifted in these various areas. It could be a number of things, but my challenge to you is this. Find and fill your role. Help others find and fill their role. So together we can turn around what we're seeing in our country. Listen, the White House isn't going to fix everything, folks. It's not. It doesn't matter who gets in there. I, I, I've got my opinions on it, but the fact of the matter is that's not going to solve the problems. Because it's really not a problem with the lost world. Lost people are lost. Save people need to step up to the plate and do our job. Do what God's called us to do. And then God will do some incredible things in and through his people who are sold out and serving him. Father, we come to you this morning thanking you for the fact that not only have you saved us, but that's a starting point. Through that saving grace, you've now gifted and called and placed us in the body to fulfill a purpose, a role. And if we don't do it, it'll either go undone or others will have to pick up the slack. Father, convict us today to find and fill our role that by design you want to place us and use us and glorify your name through us. Most importantly, there's anybody here this morning who does not know Jesus as their Savior and Lord, that they'll realize that's the starting point, that if they'll confess their sin, their need for a Savior, 
You will transform them. You'll come to live in their heart. You'll gift and place and plant them in the body of Christ and use them in ways they could never imagine. Father, use this invitation time for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Jake's going to be here at the front. In a moment as we stand and sing, if God is calling you for any reason, would you come? And let me tell you, God may be able to deal with you where you are with whatever you're, that's fine. But I know according to Scripture, everyone Jesus ever called, you know, Jesus called publicly. Everyone. And if God is dealing with you today, if you need to make a public decision, Brother Jake will be here ready to, uh, to help you through that process.